What happens if you take video game the sapling, design a planet, design a basic alga and a really simple aquatic animal and then turn on random mutations for millions of years? In game years I mean, I prefer experiments that finish within my lifetime. How will life evolve? What kind of ecosystems will emerge? That is the question I will explore in this new YouTube series called Evolution Simulated. I am planning to start this series with 3 videos and then focus on building the next big update for the game. If you all like these three episodes, however, the series will continue once that update is out of the door. So we'll see. Okay, so we start with the planet. If you've been following this channel for a while, you know that the most recent update was called the Sea and Sandbox update. So obviously I want to start with aquatic life this time. But I also want to see it evolve onto land. This means I need an ocean that's large enough, but also enough land space. I'm going for two larger islands, two continents. As for the starlight color on this planet, I want red plants and colorful algae, which can be achieved by giving this planet a lot of red light but making it unstable, along with average amounts of blue and green light. There is a lot of temperature variation in this world, from frigid snow at the peaks to a hot desert near the equator. That makes life more challenging and I'm going to make things even harder by introducing a second warmer season. Observe the beautiful advancing and retreating of the snow at the mountain tops as the seasons come and go. The warmer season is not extreme enough for true seasonal behavior to emerge, like plants losing their leaves or animals hiding in burrows, but it will mean that animals living on land near the equator will need some special adaptations to lose heat. This is assuming land animals will emerge at all of course. Will that happen? And how will that happen? What aquatic ecosystem leads to it? I am excited, let's find out. The first life form I will add is this alga, which is the default thing you get when you open the alga editor. It's not specialized for anything, so this is as basic as it gets. There's a bit of a bay right here, and I kinda like the idea of all life starting there, so this is where I'll put it. There it goes. 500 in-game years later, the algae still haven't left the bay, but we see that some organisms start to deviate a bit from the green starter color. And some algae have already evolved to specialize. Here for shallow water, here for deep water. They are ready for ocean domination. Fast forward a few thousand in-game years, and now the algae have spread to the other side of the map. As we chose a planet that supports all kinds of alga colors, the color varies at random, but is a beautiful tool to show relatedness among species. For example, the north is dominated by a family that has all shades of green, but here in the northeast the algae are predominantly dark red to black, and here in the southwest we see a lot of dark purple and dark blue. For the rest of the series, various colors will continue to come and go without a clear reason other than chance. As players of the game will know, algae are the tutorial organisms, so really simple. So from now onwards I won't go into too much detail on what alga family goes where. The important bit to remember is that there now is food for aquatic animals. This is the most basic mouth, an omnivore mouth that doesn't even have a jaw, and these are the most primitive fins. These fins in combination with a small body size result in an animal that will not be able to handle the ocean currents of the deep sea. Instead, it will need to stay close to the shore. Again, this bay is perfect. With so much free space, all of it filled with food, our starter animal spreads rapidly, in particular along the southern coast and in between the two continents. Initially, new species are only slight variations of the starter species, and all of these are omnivores. Their primary food source is algae, but they will also eat meat of other animals who died of old age, or, occasionally, the eggs of other species. With the right mouths, it's possible to extract much more energy from eggs and meat than these omnivores can. Indeed, it doesn't take long before we see a species taking advantage of this. The first carnivore emerges in between the two continents. It's a turning point in the history of this planet, because from now on, there will always be at least one aquatic carnivore species present. In fact, a few thousand years later, these carnivores have grown to be the second most successful species right after the omnivores. This is something you typically see. Even at their peak, species specializing in meat will never take the top spot. This of course makes total sense, because you always need multiple prey organisms to keep one predator organism alive. It's around this time that we reach a major milestone. The first land plants emerge. For this to happen, three conditions must be met. 1. 
There must be a shallow water alga species growing directly next to the coast. 2. This species must have a holdfast that already resembles roots. And 3. This species must be of a color that can also photosynthesize with the light available above water. On this planet, that means we need red algae. And in our case, there is a fourth requirement. The plants that emerge must develop heat resistance real quick before dying out. Most of the times this doesn't happen, like here in the north of the eastern continent. Better luck next attempt guys. I think we do see at the coast more and more, on the other hand, are corpses. This is because new, faster fins have evolved, and these fins have an extra side advantage unrelated to their success. Animals can use them to drag themselves onto land. As the ocean is getting more crowded and there always is a risk of your eggs getting eaten, the land is a welcome safe haven for those who can get there. A safe haven where they will suffocate that is, because these animals don't have any ability to survive out of the water for longer periods of time and their slow dragging style of movement prevents them from returning to the water on time. Still, the guarantee that there is a place for your egg and that it will actually hatch instead of being your neighbor's meal is worth dying for, which explains all the corpses lying around. The fact that we see multiple species do this that are not even directly related in multiple areas of the world only confirms how powerful this survival technique apparently is. A few thousand years later, two things have happened that, at least to me, are quite exciting. Firstly, the animals have adapted to survive in an area so far unexplored, the open ocean. To survive there, animals need to be larger, which you can clearly see is the case, and have more efficient fins so they can swim faster. And these adaptations happen not just once, but twice. On our planet we have two large open oceans at the poles, connected by three narrow waterways. This means that a large animal that developed in the southern ocean cannot easily reach the northern ocean and vice versa. Still, as you can see, the northern and the southern open ocean animals look quite alike. Part of the reason for this is that they share a relatively recent common ancestor, but the main reason is convergent evolution. They needed to survive in a similar environment, and so it were the same changes to their body that stuck. But perhaps the most exciting development is happening on the western continent. We will fully explore the development of the first stable life on land in the next video, which I am aiming to upload next week. If this video made you want to play the game, you can. The sapling is available in early access on Steam and Itch. Besides the sandbox mode, which we are exploring in this series, the game also has campaign challenges to teach the player about all the intricacies of the simulation. It uses very little text, but instead starts really simple and gradually makes the simulation more and more complex, so you can figure it out like a puzzle. If you want to run a simulation like this for yourself though, a bit of a warning. I'm using the largest map size here, and with the simultaneous simulation of algae, aquatic animals, and now also plants, there is a lot going on. To still get decent frame rates, I'm using a high-end gaming PC. Nearly every patch I release for the game contains some sort of optimization for some aspect of the game though, so slowly but steadily you should be able to run larger map sizes on less powerful hardware. Just be aware of the fact that the game is not fully there yet. If you are more interested in this whole development side of the project, there are also devlog videos on this channel and a Twitter feed for more fine-grained updates. Okay, see you next week.